Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Locum Cor Zugab Lolokakun Obak Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. Or at the moment, I suppose you could say a Cobalt Shrine of Pillars, in a way, because as you can see, the dwarves are now hanging out in the Cobalt Room. That's right, after our traumatizing discovery down in the caverns, we decided to gear up for a bit of a feast. It is very well earned, but cannot be accomplished without a bit more work, my dwarves. That being said, let's check in on our dwarves and see who is putting this whole thing together. Well, if we have a look over here, we can see our weaponsmith, Wisp, carrying a huge hunk of cobaltite. After making those alligator bone instruments recently, we've decided to get more devoted to the idea. It'd be nice to have a large variety of instruments to play down in the cobalt room, and so she's using this cobaltite here to fashion a Arkaf keyboard. It should be a good one. And then moving on, up here in our old stepping stone fortress, we could see Boggy busy at work preparing some food for the feast. We've decided to get him to start making some lavish meals, which are meals that require a large number of ingredients. He's been making some pretty good stuff. We're not going to take too close a look right now. Don't want to spoil the surprise after all, but the smells coming out of his kitchen are just divine. He has, however, been griping about the lack of meats. And what good's a feast without some meat? We need something. He's right. As such, we have Queen Bee over here heading up to the surface and... Well, she's getting us some meat. Some donkey meat, to be precise. We had a donkey and a water buffalo that we arrived here with. They've just been grazing up in the surface alongside our sheep. But we figured we could put them to more feast-specific use. Gotta have that meat. And this is gonna do the job just fine. But still, we need a bit more variety, I think. And luckily, you may remember that we have Sodel here, our outpost liaison. Alongside Tinny, they're having a meeting down here in the Cobalt Room as we speak. Which is just grand, because that means the merchants are here. And we do have a couple things to trade, not much, but we can get a little bit of food, I think. Oh yeah, not a bad trade at all. Gutter, our broker, was able to talk these merchants out of some cheese, some cave lobster, and a whole bunch more meat. A very good deal, seeing as how we just traded some excess furniture and a couple of cut gems, too. Gutter here seems to handle these negotiations much like he does a scalpel. With expert precision. Good, doing business with you merchants. We should probably actually try to prepare something to trade with them. Realistically, we probably won't. But it's not like we have to. We seem to be doing fine for ourselves as it is. Anywho, checking back in on our instrument progress. And it looks like we're doing fairly well. We're trying to make at least one example of every instrument that the Lancer of Oiling Dwarves traditionally use. Just to get us started. The only big problem we've run into is that some of the instrument pieces that we need to create are made out of clay. And we don't have access to clay here in the Swamp of Brightness. But we do have sand, so that's good. And as you can see over here, we have Wisp making some Langud drone pipes out of green glass. Yeah, we can make those glass pieces absolutely fine. We've already made a couple of metal pieces and some leather pieces and all the wood and bone pieces that we need. And actually, never mind, I suppose. It looks like Resourceful Wisp has located some kaolinite down in our fortress mines. That's extremely handy. It could be used instead of clay for making porcelain. So I think we can actually produce every single instrument here. Easy enough. Just wonderful. Hang in there, dwarves. The feast is coming. We've skipped ahead a little bit and produced all those instruments we were working on. As you can see, too, we've moved a lot of food down here to the Cobalt Room. We're very well stocked. It is, it's a feast, after all. Also, you can see we've rearranged some furniture, gotten things nice and straight in here, and the dwarves are getting down to it, having a good old time, too. Oh, would you look at that? They're performing some music. I'm pretty sure this is the first time they've ever actually performed some proper music in the fortress. And they're doing a pretty alright job with it, too. Just having a hard time figuring out why they're not using the instruments we just painstakingly created, but, well, it's their prerogative, I suppose. We have Tinny and Gutter both singing along, lending their voices to the song with a chant. And then we have Wisp simulating an Akum, and Boggy is simulating an Esham. So they're just kind of like making the sounds the instrument would make with their mouths, I suppose. Again, their prerogative. But then, thankfully, we actually have the Crab over here playing a land gun, a mid-sized, handheld wind instrument through which constant airflow is maintained by use of a leather bag. A wolverine leather bag in this case. And that bag is fed by a donkey leather bellows. Now, the crab here can choose the pitch of the land gun by pressing keys to stop holes in the alligator bone melody pipe. And you'll see, too, that pair of drone pipes made of green glass. Those things provide a constant accompaniment the entire time this thing is being used. It gives it a very unique sound. At a lower register, it makes kind of an eerie slicing sound. And as it goes up, it gets more full-bodied, strained, and then beyond that, it gets a bit wispy. 
It takes a great amount of skill to be able to use it properly, but the crab is doing fine. It's good to see him letting up on that crusty demeanor a bit, having a good time here with the other dwarves. This is just what we needed. And of course we have Pops and Queen Bee over here just listening along, really enjoying the performance. I wish Sodel would come out and enjoy it too, but he seems to be enjoying our drink stocks more than anything else. That's okay though. We've got plenty. Maybe not the biggest variety, but we do have some unique flavors of alcohol here in Spear Cavern. We have some spelt and finger millet beer that Boggy brewed for us, and then some dwarven rum that we got from the traders just now, and a whole bunch of whipped wine as well. We've been collecting a lot of those whipped vines from out in the forest. Surprisingly good eaten. Wouldn't think you'd do much with some scraggly old jungle vines, but well, here we are. Yes, Spear Cavern, despite its very small size, is home to quite a number of delicacies, all carefully cooked by Boggy. He should settle down, by the way. He's still cooking over here. We have enough food, Boggy. You can finish up this one, but then we want you to relax a bit, my friend. So that being said, it looks like you're working on a particularly interesting dish here. Let's see what you're working on. Okay, just finishing it up now. And it appears to be a well-prepared cave fish roast. Ooh, it's like a seafood dish. The ingredients are cave lobster, cave fish, and both goat milk and dwarven milk. Oh my, would you look at that. That is absolutely fantastic. A perfect main course for this evening's festivities. Pure decadence. You do spoil us, my friend. Wonderful, it has both goat milk and, well, you might be wondering what dwarven milk is, and don't get too panicked, it doesn't come from dwarves. It comes from an animal that we find underground. A uh, worm-like animal, a, well, it's more like a maggot. They're called purring maggots. They purr, and usually somebody goes out into the caverns and sets out a trap, waits for one of these little bastards to get into it, and then you, you know, kind of like, you squeeze the, the milk out of the maggot. Listen, it's not a tidy process, okay? But dwarven milk is pretty darn tasty. If you never had it before, you're missing out. It's got these nutty notes. It's really quite nice. It's not like a dairy product. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. You have to, you just, you just gotta try it. Oh, to die for. Yeah, we'll have to try to make our own here at some point. Thank you, Boggy. Now go relax, you mad bastard. You're working your beard to the chin over here. Ah, yes, there we go. Bunch of happy dwarves. It's really good that we finally got around to doing this. We're gonna be here a while. Might as well make the best of it, right? Now just having a look. Um, we have Boggy and Pop here sitting at a table, just socializing. While a couple of the other dwarves went running off, uh, I know Tinny has some stuff to do out in the fortress right now, but she should be back soon. Well, you know what we didn't take a look at, really? Not too closely, anyways, was our instruments. Not that we're gonna take a very close look at the rest of them, because, well, there's a lot of them. We have this chest here in the corner. If we have a look inside, we can see that Wolverine leather langud that Crab was using, as well as a Metin, and an Arketh, and an Akum, and an Astar, Tetist, Stat, Tizen, Osho. There are a whole lot of instruments in here. I don't know how they're all packed in, but it's very efficient. Altogether, we have 12 unique instruments in the Cobalt Room. It's very impressive. I wish we would use them a bit more often, but I'm just happy knowing that we got some use out of one of them. <laughs> and who knows, maybe I'll use them more in the future. Just take some practice, right? Now, let's see. I forgot what day we started off here in the Swamp of Brightness on our journey through Spear Cavern. But right now, it's the 14th of Granite in the year 118, which means I think we're approaching the end of our second year here. That's incredibly impressive. Time flies, doesn't it? Granted, I suppose it would when you're working as hard as we have. It is good to have some occasional time off, isn't it? Well, hey now, how about that? Another benefit of some time off, relationships can bloom between Pop and Gutter. That seems like an interesting pairing. Two dynamic and personable dwarves. I suppose it's bound to happen, right? <laughs> That's our third couple in the fortress, actually kind of surprising. Everyone's pairing up and finding relationships. Real surprising, but certainly not unwelcome. We can see that Tinny's back here in the Cobalt Room, done with her chores out in the fortress, and you know, I think she's got some new ideas cooking. We have been feasting for a while now, and we're still gonna let her have some time to relax with the other dwarves, of course, but we do have some work to do too, after one last song, I guess. Nah, it's fine, you guys have fun. And while you do, we will begin planning. What we're going to do is come up to this old section of mines here, clear it out a bit, and make a workshop, a new workshop, one that we can use, hopefully, to deal with our problem down in the caves. And the workshop in question is going to be a siege workshop, okay? That's a horrible monster down in the caves. And so we have to come up with an equally horrible solution, I think. We were talking about trying to kill that thing with spears and whatnot, but that still might be a bit tough. And maybe if we can soften it up a bit first, could be for the best. It'll be an interesting test nonetheless. And we do already have an early volunteer, a dwarf who's going to be the one manning the ballista, that's Gutter, right here. 
currently running up to the surface to grab some high wood and logs. He's going to start out by trying to make some quality ballista parts. It's going to take some time before we can make real high quality ones, but the higher quality ballista we have, the better. We have to have a high quality ballista and high quality, hopefully steel ballista bolts too. We're only going to have one crack at this, I think, so we're going to have to make it count. Practice itself is going to be a big part of this whole process, and as such, over here we're going to make a little ballista practice chamber, just barely wide enough for us to squeeze a ballista in. Now we're going to put a ballista in here and use it to fire northward up against this wall, and the ballista bolts will hit this wall and then fall down to the lower level, where we can collect them and bring them back up and use them again, just again and again. This will give Gutter some good practice. And then over here, just beside it, you can see another tunnel that is designated to be dug out. A long tunnel. A very, very long tunnel. It's sort of ridiculous, but we need that practice so that we can set up a ballista down here, far to the south. So when something comes running down this tunnel, we can shoot a ballista bolt up to the north, and it can just sail completely straight down that corridor, and hopefully hit something far, far away, you know? This tunnel here is so terribly long just to, you know, for safety's sake. And so hopefully, maybe we can get two shots off before the thing comes running in, you know? Yeah, we're pretty excited about this. And if this works, it will certainly work against some forgotten beasts, and possibly also against Rofa up on the surface. Although, I can't imagine we get Rofa to come down here through this tunnel. The thing seems completely content up there, actually. It is fairly entertaining that we came here with the express purpose to kill this creature, but we haven't really showed much interest in it so far. I don't know, it's not like we hate the creature, it's, you know, it's kind of like a mascot at this point, honestly. <laughs> it's an interesting beast, and we find some mote of comfort when we hear the thing stomping around and killing grasshoppers. One day, one day, we're not in a huge rush. What I will say is that when we do kill this creature, we're not going to do it with a ballista. That's not honorable. We'll have to take it down with dwarf and steel. It'd only be proper, but that time is not today. Rest for now, Rofa. You are safe, but your time comes. Ah, uh, but yes, we still have a lot of work to do before our ballista tunnel is completed. Tinny's gonna keep on working on that in the background. And Gutter's up here in the siege workshop, pumping out ballista parts. He's getting it down. He's gonna make some good ones before long. And then we have the crab over here making some steel bars. Just pumping the things out. We can make so many steel bars here, it's great. We'll have some nice steel ballista arrowheads made by Wisp shortly. Steel is easily accessible here in Spear Cavern, which is something the crab is very happy about. We haven't mentioned it yet, but he has already set into work making armor for the dwarves, and he has produced seven steel helmets, one for every dwarf. It's good to see that's just a, the beginning of it, though. We still need gauntlets, boots, greaves, breastplates, and shields. There's a whole bunch we have to get to. But if these helms are any measure of his skill, then, well... They are going to be some damn fine suits of armor when they're done. Excited to see how that comes out. And actually, something else a bit interesting here with the crab, in regards to Wisp, down here, and the cobalt rope. It looks like these two are now lovers. But hold up a second, you might say. The crab and Queen Bee are together. Well, it looks like Wisp is now with the crab as well. Both Wisp and Queen Bee are now lovers with the crab. This is an interesting turn open relationships like this are not at all uncommon with the Lancer of Oiling Dwarves, and they do tend to work out absolutely fine, but they can cause some friction too. It will be interesting to see how this relationship evolves. Certainly their skills complement each other very well, Armorsmith, Weaponsmith, but as Dwarves, their personalities aren't really the most similar. The Crab is very notoriously dour. While Wisp is not one to speak her mind, she just is kind of quiet. But, I don't know, maybe having some time together down in the Cobalt Room here has kind of opened up their personalities to one another and they can experience those nuances. It's almost a certainty that they appreciate each other's skills. That probably has more to do with it than anything, really. It'll be interesting to see the relationship between these two evolve over time, as well as the relationship between the Crab and Queen Bee, and Wisp and Queen Bee as well. Hmm. Yes, very, very interesting. I'm hoping for the absolute best from you dwarves. Good luck, my friends. We'll have to keep our eyes open to see if any other relationships like this pop up. I wouldn't be surprised if we had a big tangle of relationships by the end of this. I'm just hoping it's all positive. And Idrath willing it will be. Well, that's an interesting turn. It looks like we have some visitors here in Spear Cavern. We weren't expecting any wagons to arrive. It's still just the beginning of summer, and the dwarves come in fall. But these are definitely not dwarves. Much taller, actually. No, it looks like we have been graced by the presence of humans. A small group of traveling merchants. That is interesting. I guess I thought we were so far from civilization that we couldn't expect any other people to show up here. Another interesting tidbit is that these humans here seem to be from a different empire than the Empire of Dale's humans that we typically deal with. A different civilization of men. Huh. 
Dwarves, I think we're making first contact here. I don't think we've ever had dealings with these people. That is interesting. We'll have to start things off on the right foot here. I didn't expect our dwarves to act as envoys to a new realm. Uh, we'll have to see what we can scrounge up to trade. Just a moment. Okay, we're gonna get Wisp here to start making some spears. Iron spears, nothing too fancy. We do have plenty of steel here, but it is still sort of a pain to make. We have tons of iron laying around. Those humans are gonna be more than happy with some iron spears. Additionally, Gutter made a whole bunch of ballista parts here, and a lot of them are subpar quality, so we're just gonna trade the worst ones. I'm sure they'll be happy enough with these, though. They're not bad. And as for you, Gutter, you're uh, this is gonna be kind of a big deal here. It's not all business like when we typically deal with the dwarves. We have to behave ourselves, put on a good face, you know. I think you're gonna do a stellar job, though, my friend. You have my full confidence. Let's see how this goes. Okay, all right, not a bad trade, considering we just traded a bunch of random stuff we had laying around. These humans here brought some food, some interesting little crafts, including a ring that we traded for, and a couple of unique human-made instruments, too, ones that we have not seen before. We figured, what the hell, might as well add to our growing collection, right? A good starter trade. And as for these humans, and their origins, well, it would appear that they are from the Oceanic Realm, which really isn't even all that close to us. They're over here, in the northwest of Athira Etha, a land far, far away from our home. They have a whole list of things going on over here that we don't know anything about. And I'm hoping that by dealing with these humans, we're not dragging our people into a whole new mess. But I'm sure it'll be fine. These humans seem like a stout, sturdy bunch. Trusty, reliable, just like the Empire of Dale's humans. I don't foresee us having any trouble. Now then, back to business here in the fortress. Unfortunately, it seems like we missed Gutter's first shot here with the ballista. He must have got to it right after that trade, but it looks like it's down on the ground there, ready to be picked up and reloaded, so... Oh yes, there he goes. Well, we'll see his second shot, hopefully. There we go. He's grabbed it, he's coming back up, and is reloading. Just gotta give him a second here. Takes him a bit, he's still learning. Okay, there we go. That was actually pretty straight. Good job there, Gutter. Gonna take some more practice, but we're just gonna have him doing this for now. He's our chief medical dwarf, and we haven't suffered any injuries or anything yet, and I don't foresee us suffering any, so it's fine if he just spends his time training. He'll have a good amount of skill in no time, I'm thinking. And now looking to a different section of our fortress, Spear Cavern proper. Ooh. Looks like we have a nice fully dug out chamber here, doesn't it? We have one, two, three levels all dug out. The whole central cavern is now complete for the most part. Still have to smooth it up and stuff. Of course, there's, there's an awful lot left to do, but it is getting there. While the dwarves were relaxing at their feast, we had Tinny over here carving out the rest of this cavern. She carved out the second layer entirely by herself. And then after the feast, we had Pop and Tinny come and do this whole layer by themselves. And they did it very quickly, too. A couple of stellar miners, those two. They really do work quite well together. I think we'll get the rest of this carved out much quicker than we expect. As for the smoothing process, though, eh, might take a bit longer, but that's okay. Not in any huge rush. The dwarves are all very happy right now. Stupendously happy, actually. All seven of them are in the best mood possible. Even Pop, no worries there. There were some concerns that she wasn't going to be so happy, but no, she's doing absolutely fine goes to show you what a little bit of care can do for a dwarf. Though that being said, one of the biggest gripes our dwarves have these days is the lack of military training. It seems unanimous amongst their population that they want to train. They want to spend some time with their weapons and their armor doing some serious training. And who could blame them? We embarked here for the express purpose of hunting monsters, and here we are, having spent all this time here, and all we have to show for our efforts is one measly alligator. I suppose it does make it pretty tough when we can't go out into the caverns underground due to that terrible creature we saw. And I guess that's the one big hinge point as to why we're not doing more hunting. <laughs> we have to deal with that monster first, and that's what our ballista is all about. As such, we can have a look down here where we can see Gutter constantly at practice. His skills are coming along surprisingly fast, and he's already a competent siege operator. Look at that, another stellar straight shot. Granted, I suppose this practice tunnel is a little bit shorter than the other tunnel we're actually going to be using. <laughs> but still, love to see it. And up here to the surface, where we have our metalsmith's forge, we can see Wisp working on a steel ballista head. I'm thinking we should really try to come up with a couple masterwork pieces before we take on that cave monster. Better safe than sorry, right? But, I mean, how long can we wait realistically? Can't really expect to get things 100% perfect, right? Eh, we'll see. We'll see. Oh, and hey, just realized that... It's fall now, and so the traders have arrived. They're moving in now from the south, and, you know, I don't think we have anything to trade with them. And you, <laughs> it's funny that I can say that every single time any traders arrive and act surprised. At this point, I suppose it's to be expected. We'll never have anything to trade. That's okay, though, because we always do manage to find something. How about some crappy steel ballista bolt heads? Actually, that might be a good thing to trade. See, there we go. We're all set. <laughs> What 
was that? Oh no, it looks like we have a dead dwarf here. Somebody wandered into Rofa's shrine and was killed. And not just killed either, they were torn to shreds. There's an arm over here, a leg. Then we have their corpse just laying on the ground in this swamp. Still wearing their armor and holding their crossbow. It was a Mark's dwarf, one of the caravan guards that just showed up. The poor bastard didn't stand a chance. Really wish I knew why they came over here though, and nobody else did. Maybe they were trying to kill the creature themselves, grab our glory. Or perhaps they just wandered in here, took a bit of a wrong turn, got separated from the caravan, maybe. Hard to say at this point. But this poor guard certainly paid the price. That being said, it looks like Rofa did take a pretty decent shot in that fighting. Its right rear foot is somewhat damaged. Took a crossbow bolt to it. Yeah, I suppose that'll happen. I gotta say, we would have been pretty genuinely upset if Rofa was killed. Both because we like the monster and because that's our monster to kill. <laughs> but it looks like things have settled down at this point. We'll have to try to do something about that poor dwarf's corpse out there. Not that I think it'd be very safe to get it pulled out of there and properly interred, but can't really go leaving it out there in the swamp, right? Hmm. We'll put some thought into it, but for now we have some business to attend to. As for our trading, we did make a bunch of those iron spears to trade with the humans when they arrived in summer. And that was a decent enough trade, I suppose. The iron spears did a okay job. But we did realize that a single steel spear is worth probably three times as much as an iron spear. So in terms of efficiency and making items at the very last second like we are apt to do, I think steel is our best bet. And so after Wisp's drink here, we're going to have her make at least a couple of steel spears. We can afford it. We'll just give her a second on that. And then back to Gutter over here, unrelated to our trading, we're going to have him assemble a steel ballista bolt right now. And that requires one of those steel heads that Wisp just made, as well as some wood. And we're going to go with almond wood, because it's pretty dense. It's going to, you know, add some weight to the projectile, help it punch its way through that cave monster when it strikes. And there we have it, a well-crafted steel ballista arrow. Not quite masterwork, but you know, that might do just fine. We'll put together a couple more, but I'm feeling more and more confident about this as we go. I think... Yeah, I think this is going to probably do fine. The confidence is evident, isn't it? More trouble up top. Giant buzzards again. A whole flock of them. But it looks like they're being taken care of. One of the caravan spear dwarves is taking on this one. Pretty handily, too. And you know, I just saw a gutter out here, too. I thought he was running in. Not too sure where he ended up. I hope he's safe. Well, looks like this buzzard's down. And as for Gutter, it looks like he's ended up in the branches of this tree. Not too sure why. Uh, he's not a coward. Actually, maybe he was climbing up here to get a better advantage of the buzzard, you know? Maybe ambush the thing when it tried to fly off. That makes sense. That's some good thinking there, Gutter. But, well, he, he came down now. <laughs> Just comes down and is standing next to this donkey now. <laughs> and then the donkey clambers up into the branches. I don't know why that would be. No, it, it's up there, too. It is really high up there for some reason. Okay. Well, have fun. We're going to have to chop this tree down if that donkey can't get out. Eh, okay. We'll try to remember you're up here. Anywho, back over here to the depot, and it unfortunately it looks like those merchants were scared away by that buzzard attack. Not that the buzzards were actually attacking, they're just kind of swooping over. Most likely trying to get into the food that the merchants brought, but... Regardless, the traders are no longer here. They're kind of scattered around, and some of them left already. Well, we still have a couple stragglers here and there. Hoping nobody else gets killed by Rofa, or giant buzzards for that matter. But it does look like at the moment our trade for this year is concluded. A damn shame, but not devastating. There's always next year. Now then, back to business in the fortress. If you have a look down here at the southern end of our ballista hallway, you can see a ballista, which is in the process of being constructed by Gutter. We do have some pretty good ballista parts now. They are exceptional. Not masterwork, but yeah, it's probably good enough. I'm thinking what we're going to do is go to the opposite end of the ballista tunnel, the one that's going to lead out to the caverns, and we're going to build a door, okay? Once that door's in place, we're going to open up the way to the caverns, right? And that miner's going to run to the other side of the door. We're going to lock the door just until we're ready, but that'll keep us safe. We can see these doors out here have not been touched by that monster so far, so I think a door is going to do absolutely fine, but we'll make it an iron door just to be safe. And once that's all set, we gotta get our ballista set. Gotta make sure our steel ballista bolt is all loaded up. And maybe get a couple others down here as well. Just so perhaps we can get another shot off. Perhaps. I'm not gonna get too risky. I'm sure it'll get dangerous eventually though. And when it does, Gutter's gonna jump off the ballista real quick, go to the other side of this door that we're getting in place. And then we'll be good. That monster will be locked out of the fortress. Worst comes to worst, we're not gonna be able to use this tunnel again until that monster vacates the premises. But in a good case scenario, we'll kill the creature outright or be able to weaken it enough so that we can go out and kill it ourselves. But one step at a time. First, we gotta plug some holes in that beast. 
Though I am noting now that we accidentally loaded up a wooden ballista bolt here, so, um, well, what the hell? Now is as good a time as any to send this thing flying. Let's give it a test shot, see how it does. Okay, Gutter should be on his way. And here he comes. And it is off. Oh, man, look at that. Straight down all the way down past the cobalt room, down to the stairway even. Man, oh, man. Okay, so, hell yeah. That's really great. All right, well, you know, we have our steel bolts, we have our well-crafted ballista, and we have a skilled siege operator. As scary as it sounds, I think we're pretty much ready to go on this. Though there is one last thing I want to do. It shouldn't take too much longer. It'll be an interesting test, I think. And there we go. How's that? This tunnel's pretty much all set up now, except you can see we have three ballistas. I don't know if these things can shoot past each other, but we're going to find out soon enough. You can also see we have those two doors on the side as well as that stockpile, and that's for additional ballista arrows. It's a good place for them, I think. Okay, there we go, getting all loaded up here. Okay, and that's going to do it. Three steel ballista arrows and three very nicely made ballista. Now then, our first step is going to be to come down here and open up the ballista tunnel. It should be a safe process, the caves have been quiet recently. And of course we have brave Tinny taking on the task. She's eager to see that monster killed, I'm sure. Okay, there we go. The cavern is open and this door is locked. We'll get Gutter in position, then we'll unlock that door and see what happens. There we go, excellent. Hang tight, my friend. Because now we're going to unlock this door and see what happens. Let's say a prayer to Idrath, dwarves. Hope it all goes alright. So we must find another way. Well hello you bearded bastards, and welcome to the end of the episode where we're going to be talking about some particularly charged behind the scenes things. And my goodness it couldn't come at a better time. If I had to see those ballista bolts pass through that horse demon and then record a whole another 15 minutes of episode before getting to this, I'd probably explode. Could you tell me why ballista arrows do not affect demons, because that seems to be exactly what happened here. There's no combat log, like the creature didn't dodge away from the ballista arrows as they were going down the hallway. They just did not interact at all, which leads me to think that demons are immune to ballista arrows, which seems kind of stupid. I could, I mean, okay, so in Dwarf Fortress certain creatures cannot be affected by traps, like cage traps and weapon traps, because it'd be super cheesy if they could be affected, like if you got attacked by demons and just had a hallway absolutely cluttered up with cage traps and just caught them all in cages, it'd completely nullify the threat immediately, which, you know, that'd be too easy. 
easy. But we're gonna circle back to this in a second. I did not know, however, that demons could not be affected by ballista arrows, which is kind of annoying because ballista arrows and ballistas are kind of a giant pain to make. Like, it's not the worst thing to make them, but to get a high quality one with like a steel head on the actual arrow and then to get a high quality ballista and then someone who's well trained, that's a lot more steps than it is to make a good cage trap. As it stands, to get the best cage trap in the game right now, all you need is a piece of stone and a piece of wood to make a mechanism and a cage, and there you go. Super easy. So yeah, I could see why you wouldn't be able to make a cage trap like that and trap demons. But man, I just do not see why you couldn't use a ballista against demons if you wanted to. I had done a bit of research beforehand too, which I don't typically do. Like I checked up the Dwarf Fortress wiki and, you know, was looking up stuff about ballistas. That's how I knew a higher density wood would increase the power of the ballista arrow. And you know, the entire time I was looking around on there, I didn't see anything about demons being immune to ballista arrows. And even after the fact, I went on there because I was like, oh man, I'm sure it said it right there, but I didn't see anything. Nothing at all. It just seems strange. You know, back to the whole cage trap thing there. You can't catch forgotten beasts and demons in cage traps, okay? But you can catch things like giants and dragons, which seems weird, right? Because like you can use the crappiest wooden cage trap to catch a dragon that's been trouncing around on your world for the past thousand years. And like that dragon ain't going anywhere. It will spend the next thousand years in that cage trap if you keep playing for that long. Like, that doesn't make sense, right? Why can dragons be caught in cage traps? I'm gonna head into some territory right now that I don't typically go into when it comes to Dwarf Fortress, but, okay, I know there's a lot of stuff in the game that has to be done still. I get that. The game's gonna be in development for the next 20, 30 years, I'm sure. But man, there are a couple things that could be looked at that would really improve the game a whole bunch, I feel. I'm usually more than willing to accept the game in its current state bugs and all, but after a massive punch to the gut like this, uh, uh, I don't know man. The most frustrating part of it is that I feel like I've let you down. I know it's not my fault, I know it's just how the game works, but like maybe if I'd done some more research or some testing beforehand I would have known. If nothing else, I can take solace in the fact that I can now commiserate with some of you bastards out there who were terribly let down like I was. You live, you learn, you don't shoot ballistas at demons. Let me collect my thoughts. There's got to be some positive points in this episode, right? I don't want to spend the entire time ranting about demons and ballistas. Um, well, the crab and wisp there, getting together. It's our first polyamorous dwarven situation. I haven't seen that before. I had heard that that was in the game, but I had yet to see it. I don't really know how that's going to affect things, if at all. It's kind of something I have narrative trouble with. I'm working under the assumption now that it's like an open relationship sort of a deal, and that the crab isn't like cheating on Queen Bee. I assume that's how it works, but I don't know. Time will tell, I suppose. Oh, and we also saw those humans too from the West. That's pretty cool. I know humans can be a bit surly sometimes. Like they make very good allies, but they can be a little testy too. Not testy like the elves, but sometimes they'll just start war for no reason. It's not too, too likely, but I think that'd be kind of cool if it did happen. I mean, actually, I guess it probably wouldn't be because we only have the seven dwarves here. I was thinking we had a full on dwarven fortress. Eh, nothing wrong with a little spice. Worst comes to worst, we just turn the ballista on the humans. <laughs> I'm sure it would work on them. Ooh, yeah, back to that ballista too. Actually, something really cool that I haven't heard mentioned before is like how I lined the ballistas up like that. Even if that is common knowledge in Dwarf Fortress community, I'm gonna take independent credit for that one. That's an idea I came up with all by myself. Putting one in front of the other like that, getting them all loaded up, and then if you have just one siege operator kind of like locked away from everything, they'll just jump from one ballista to the next, and apparently the ballista bolts will just go through ballistas like that. So like, I imagine if you had a bunch of ballistas all set up all over the place, all loaded up, like across a field or something like that, then like, I mean, you could just have your operators go and pull the trigger on each of them and just send a flurry of bolts out like that. That makes ballistas a bit more effective in my mind. I don't know, I'm kind of excited about that prospect. Ballista loading and layering. A really neat concept. Spear Cavern's gonna make some use out of these goddamn ballistas. It's gonna happen. Man, do you think they work against Forgotten Beasts? Like, I, in my mind, am like, well, they don't work against demons, but they must work against Forgotten Beasts, right? Somebody out there, if you do know, let me know if that does work. Just so we can avoid that disappointment again, please. Thank you very much. Anyways, okay, so we're getting down there now. My bearded bastards, I thank you so much for watching, and I am sorry for the delay on this episode. Doing that animated intro for the last episode really kind of screwed me up, though I do like how it came out. And on top of that, I got COVID again. And so if you noticed me sounding a little bit funny during this episode, that'd be why. But we did it. We're here. Episode completed, and I'm feeling good now. And on that note, my bearded bastards, I thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you had a good time, and I certainly hope to see you next time here in Locum Cor Zugab Lolakokun Obak, Spear Cavern.
the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. And until then, you bearded bastards.